right, go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village. This is your first time here. My name's Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church, and I am thankful and grateful for you being here this morning. If you have your Bibles, we are going to be in Philippians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be covering just the first few verses in Philippians this morning. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to, to share God's Word with you. And so when diving into Philippians, we started this series last week, but we were actually in Acts 16 last week. We talked about how the church at Philippi began with Paul receiving a vision that he needed to go to Macedonia. And so in going to Macedonia, he initially entered in through Philippi, an important city, a Roman colony. Uh, people came to faith in Jesus through his testimony, through the works that God was doing through him. He ended up in jail for that purpose. And then through that, God worked some amazing things. And then many more people came to faith in Jesus Christ. And a church was ultimately started in Philippi. And so Paul initially went to Philippi somewhere around 51 AD. And then the letter to the church at Philippi, what we're going to be getting into, was written about 10 or 11 years later. And so by the tone of the letter as a whole in all four chapters, we can see that the church had grown and was making disciples. And so the theme of this letter is kind of different than some of the themes in other letters that we find throughout the New Testament from Paul, where he has more of a corrective tone. In this one, it is a tone of encouragement, a tone that he's encouraging them to keep going. Uh, that he wanted to encourage them to keep going for the gospel that he believes will be victorious in this world and that the church at Philippi was to order their lives around the truth of that and that the world was headed to where the gospel would triumph and the kingdom of God would be had. Now that is what we mean when we talk about in this uh, series particularly living a Godward life. And so in living a life worth living for, we're going to live our lives towards what God has promised this world will be in the future, what he will deliver into this world. And so if you believe that God is going to redeem people through the gospel, if you believe that he's going to build his church and that he's going to return for his people to establish his forever kingdom, then that will affect the way that you live your life. And Paul writes this letter to encourage the church at Philippi to live out their belief in those promises. And so if we believe that God will deliver on the promises that he has made in the Bible, then we will live in light of that belief. And so the letter starts with a standard introduction. Um, so in those days, when you wrote a letter, you didn't sign your name at the end of it. You signed your name at the beginning of it. And so we just see a standard introduction. He introduces himself, Paul and Timothy, servants of God. And so when we see that type of attitude that he's beginning with, he's starting from a standpoint that everything I'm going to say is going to come out of my posture towards who God is and the life that God has called me to live. It's, but as I've studied these verses, I see something in verses 3 through 7 that should impact the way that we live our lives. That the Apostle Paul is talking about his gospel partnership with the Philippian church. And he's talking about his relational connectedness to them. He's talking about the love that he has for those people. And so when I considered these verses, when I've been studying these verses, I've seen this great connection the Apostle Paul makes throughout the New Testament. Really what we see throughout all of the Scripture as a whole is that it is the relationships in our lives that will have a great impact on our growth in following Christ either for our good in growing in ways of following Jesus or as a detriment to us in the relationships that we form in our lives, those relationships that are the closest, those relationships that are the most influential, that we invest the most amount of time in, that they can serve to advance our faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ or they can serve to detract us and distract us to a place where we cannot grow in following Jesus because of the people that we have surrounded ourselves with. And to just put it bluntly, we can see where we are going by where the people around us are going. But that is a universal truth that you cannot avoid. That is a universal truth that you cannot get out of. 
The people you surround yourself with are very important. And so what I want to do this morning is drill down on that. What are you learning from the people around you? And how can you ensure that you have gospel partnership in your life? So look in Philippians 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until even now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Pray with me. Lord, you've given us your word, and it is not simply so that we can know it. It is not simply so that we can read it and receive facts from it, Lord, but you would have us to receive your grace so that you can change our lives. Lord, my prayer this morning is that you would give us the faith that we need to receive your word that you would give us the faith that we need to obey your word and have it to change our lives. Lord, this morning, I pray that you would be merciful to me, a sinner. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Getting right into it, number one this morning, you need to find your people. You need to find your people. That is the theme of this section of the book of Philippians. It is about the people that are in your life. Life. And when you look at the way that Paul talks about the people in the Philippian church, it is an unusual type of friendship. See, he's talking about a friendship. He's talking about a connectedness. He's talking about an affection that is based primarily on their mutual belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he's saying to them is, is I thank God every time I remember you. Why would he say something like that? See, because most of the relationships that we have in our lives, they impact us, but they do not impact us in this way. And so can you look at the relationships that you've had in your life for even an extended period of time and say, my fondness of those people, my connection to those people, it flows out of our belief in the gospel and because of the discipleship that we have seen take place in each other's lives, because of the good that I've seen in someone's life, because of the hard season that we've endured together. But we know that the root of this relationship, we know that the root of our connectedness flows out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Paul is not writing to them because they have this great connectedness because they're such big fans of the real housewives. Paul is not writing to them because they have such a shared commonality that we are in the same fantasy football league. Paul's not writing about that, but those are the things that the real relationships in our life tend to flow from. Things that are not eternal, but rather simple commonalities that we have with one another that will not outlive our lives. No matter what it is, if it won't outlive you, it is not this type of relationship. Because all of us have people in our lives, but that doesn't mean we've found our people. So you have coworkers. Maybe you have people that you see at a specific place at a specific time every week. You've probably got family members, for good or bad. You've probably got relationships in a place that you go for a commonality that you have because of an affinity that you share, but that is not what Paul is talking about here. Paul is talking about the unusual connectedness that can only flow because you are pursuing Jesus together. And if it were not for that, we would have no connection. Paul is saying through his writing to them that most of the things that we base our friendships on are meaningless and worthless. There is a great possibility that you have gone 
much of your life and had people in your life, but you haven't found your people. You haven't found friendship that's meaningful. You haven't found relationship that means something. You haven't found what Paul calls a gospel partnership. And the truth that you need to receive and let change you is that does not have to be true. You need to let the gospel come into your life and change you because, number one, the gospel frees you from the tyranny of self-centeredness. The reason that you do not have gospel partnerships is because you are a self-centered person. You see, Christianity is all about God. Let's get that straight. He is the center of all that we do. And that's different than what our default mode is. Our default mode is all about the self. This is what we need to be redeemed from. Sometimes, though, we can say it's all about God and say it in a sense that helps us continue in selfish patterns. Life being all about God means that we are about what God is about. We are trying to empty ourselves of self-centeredness and make our mission the same as God's. I mean, look at the scriptures. It's pretty clear about a couple of things about God. God loves people. God saves people. God works in amazing ways to show his power to people. God works to build people up. Notice Paul's posture. There is something about his attitude in that he is very telling about the path to real growth. In his path to real growth, it is less about him and more about them. Paul's focus is on God, and his outlet of that focus is on other people. And his mission to love others doesn't detract from his God-centered vision. Rather, it is his God-centered vision that makes him so passionate about helping other people find the life that he has found. I often come into contact with people that will say, and you say these in well-meaning ways, but it's so wrong. It's like, oh, just me and Jesus, that's all I need. Just me and my Bible, I'm building a community there. That is a lie. That's not true. You will not find such an ethic anywhere in Scripture that God ever says that you as an individual are sufficient that you as an individual can grow in following Jesus alone. You can't do it. Discipleship everywhere in Scripture, from Genesis through Exodus. Yes, let me, Genesis through Revelation. Uh, first two, there's a lot more after that, all right? <laughs> I wasn't looking down there, so I got it wrong. But when you look at the scriptures from Genesis through Revelation, this theme where it comes to becoming the people that God wants us to become flows out of relational connectedness to other people who are also joining us in becoming the people that God wants us to become. In the history of Israel, you see it over and over. In the history of the church, you see it over and over that God is forming community. He is not forming individuals as lone rangers on a journey to get to him. And so when you do that, you disconnect yourself from the primary method that God has for you to grow as one of his followers. And you do it to great detriment to yourself. You're not helping yourself. All that you're doing is perpetuating a self-centered vision of life and a self-centered vision of you being smarter and better and being the exception to every rule. You are not the exception to any rule. I remember when I was in seminary, uh, I took a couple of church planning classes, and even at that time, I didn't have any intention to become a church planter. I just thought they were going to be easy electives, so I took them. And our professor had a tremendous amount of experience in church planting, and he was telling us all of these things that he, as he studied over the years, as he got his PhD in this, he was saying, and, and he, this is going to be true at this level, and then this is going to happen at this level, and then this is going to happen at this stage in the life of your church. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, if I was you know, in this, none of those things would be true about me. I am the exception to all of those rules. 
Over the past nine years in the life of Village Church, I have found every single stage to be exactly as he said it was going to be. And one theme went throughout. I am not the exception to the rule. <laughs> but here's what you need to receive. Neither are you. God does not have a distinctive plan for your spiritual growth than he has for the person sitting next to you. God does not look at you and say, you are my unique one. Here's a special path for your growth. But many of you believe that he does. And that's because you are your God. That is self-worship. That is not following Jesus. Jesus makes many blanket commands to all of his followers because he has defined a path of discipleship that is not based on you. You don't know who it's based on? Him. He is the unique one. He is the anointed one. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is Lord, and I am not. And so what you need to understand about the gospel partnership that you need in your life is that it must bring you to an end of yourself for you to grow in the way that God has for you to grow. See, Paul's focus is on God. And his outlet of that is on other people. See, his mission is to love others. His God-centered vision gives him a passion for other people. But in that, you need to understand another thing. That gospel partnership comes from a shared faith. See, he's not talking about evangelism here. He's not talking about reaching people who don't know about the gospel. See, Paul's talking about when he says we have a gospel partnership, when he says, oh, every time I think of you, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And when I think about you, I'm driven to prayer for you. And that fills my prayers with a joy that is amazing. What he's doing is he's saying, because we share this faith, we can help one another grow. So you desperately need other Christians in your life. And you might be saying, but you don't know the Christians that are in my life. And I'll say, trust me, I've met those types of Christians. And you might be one too. Let me tell you something, people are exhausting. Have you ever entered into a conversation with someone so full of energy. You say, I've, man, I am so full of life. I'm so full of energy. And by the time that conversation was over, you were looking for a Gatorade because you feel like your electrolytes have been depleted. It's like, I feel like I just ran a half marathon in that conversation. I am exhausted. People will drain you. Hey, trust me. I know what that is like. It's tough. But the key of what Paul's talking about here, do you think the church at Philippi didn't have those people? We think about the New Testament church, and we almost dehumanize these people and put halos over them. No, there were people in the church at Philippi that Paul would have labeled difficult. I can guarantee it. There are people in the church at Philippi that if Paul was visiting and they walked in the door, he'd have been like, oh my goodness, let me start a conversation real quick. I got to stay away from that guy. He's a, he will drain me. Timothy, go talk to him. Keep him away. But see, Paul's looking at this, and here's the key that you need to understand about understanding your relationships where the gospel is concerned. See, we have a God that did not pursue people whom he found worthy, but rather he pursued a people he knew were not worthy. God emptied himself in order to redeem for himself a people. So trust me. There will be people who empty you. And God is saying, now you are beginning to grow in becoming more like me. There will be difficult people, but that is not an excuse to disengage. That is an excuse to depend on the Lord. You've got to find people that share the same faith that you share, and you've got to commit to them. Some of the favorite people in my life are people who have endured hard seasons with me. Sometimes it's people who have endured hard seasons because of me. I love those people because we have this thing. We say, remember this. 
I mean, I look at the guys that started Village Church with me, and we have fought some battles. We have bled. We have blood, sweat, and tears done work and there were a lot of hard moments i mean there are moments when we look at each other and say remember year three when i almost quit because of you (laughs) i love people who've been part of the church for many years and they will say there was a season where it was hard for me to be here but i was committed to these people and i endured through that hard season and i emerged from that hard season more like Jesus than I was before that season. That's what commitment will do in your life. When you find your people, you commit to those people. And you don't define your life by walking away. So many times, I've heard so many stories about churches and people leaving those churches, and I always think if they had just stuck it out. If they had just endured that season, number one, they would have been more like Jesus. But number two, that church would have been more of a home to them because they endured a hard season with their people. See, when you find your people, it's not always going to be a bright and shiny day. Storms are going to come. Tough times will happen. You will annoy each other. But when you find your people, you find commitment. And you root down. And you say, I'm committed to you growing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not that there's never a reason to walk away. There are. But those are far more few and far between than we think they are. And in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, Paul's writing to another church. And he writes this. He says, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Because you would become very dear to us. It's amazing what Paul is saying. Because Paul is a preacher of the gospel. He's saying, I didn't just preach. And I didn't just teach the best news that this world has ever seen. I also found a relationship in which I wanted to give of myself. I wanted you to know me as I was known by you. And some of you are there thinking. You're saying, I can't have that. I don't know if it's a hurt. I don't know if it's shame. I don't know if it's guilt. If it's something that you've endured through. I don't know if it's some hardship that you've been through. But you've actually closed yourself off from the potential of sharing that type of life-giving relationship that Paul is talking about there. And what I want you to understand is that the gospel of Jesus Christ means that you can have this no matter what you've been through. But more than that, if you follow Jesus, you need this. You need people in your life that you give yourself into. You give your lifeblood into that relationship because you know that they need to know you and you need to know them. You need to find your people. You need to surround yourself by, with people that are passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you have that? Have you ever sensed that type of gospel partnership? I tell you, I'm blessed. I have been blessed and am blessed to have relationships like that in my life. I have so many of them. The Lord has put so many men and women who love Jesus into my life, who give of themselves to me, who tear out me from me, and we have a gospel partnership. People in the life of this church, people in other churches, pastors of other congregations, the Father just keeps putting those people in my life, and some of them wear me out, some of them exhaust me, some of them I'm like, not today, but every one of those, as I've been writing, as I've been thinking about it, it draws me to prayer for them, and I'm praying with joy. And I thank my God in all my remembrance of every single one of them. Do you have that in your life? Do you want that in your life? But either way, you will not be able to follow Jesus without that in your life. Number two this morning, 
you and your friends will end up in the same place. You and your friends will end up in the same place. A simple statement, but a profound reality. See, in verse 6, we usually treat that as a proof text about the sovereignty of God, and it is. But it's far more than that. We can't treat it as an island in and of itself because verse 6 is surrounded in this context of Philippians 1, 1 through 11, which is all about the relationships in your life. You see, Paul had confidence in the promises of God. In verse 6, it encourages us that God will deliver on his promises. Here's what it says. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He's saying a couple of things in this text that we need to understand, that he is not doing with this what we normally do. We say, okay, this is a text about eternal security, and it is, but it's more than that. See, he's not talking about the beginning stages of your faith in Jesus Christ in that text. Note that he's saying what God began, he wants to complete. See, Paul's focus in this text is the process of becoming the person that God wants you to be. He's talking about the process of following Jesus to the end of your life and what that will look like. He's saying that if God began something in your life, he will complete it. You will grow. You will change. You will become more like Jesus or he didn't start something. He will bring to completion the work that redemption starts. See, he's not talking about cheap forgiveness. Paul is saying that our lives are meant to go somewhere. We are meant to grow towards the goal of becoming like Jesus. See, some of you believe that you have a mythical pause button on that. You say, God was working in my life, but I, I just, I'm in a season where I needed to press pause. I think you've got it twisted. I think you've got the authority structure backwards because if you could press pause, you're the redeemer. If you could press pause, you're the savior. If you could press pause, you're God. If you can press pause, that makes me wonder, did God ever push play? Because you can't stop what he wants to complete. See, I heard many years ago, Jerry Falwell talking, this was towards the end of his life, he was telling us that the fourth quarter is the most important quarter in any game. The fourth quarter is more important than the first quarter because how you finish determines who you actually were. And I thought about the Super Bowl, not this year, but last year. And I'm not a football fan. I usually meet my quota with one game a year, and that's the Super Bowl. I didn't even make that this year. right? But I did happen to watch last year. At the end of the third quarter, it was 28-3. to three. I mean, people are leaving the stadium. People are turning the channel. The nacho cheese got a little bit low, so everybody left the party. And by the time everybody got home, they saw that the outcome did not look like what it was supposed to look like at the end of the third quarter. It was supposed to look like the Atlanta Falcons walking away, creaming the Patriots. But, of course, Tom Brady, being Tom Brady, he said no. And he walked out on the fourth quarter, and it ended with the Patriots winning the game. Because the fourth quarter was more important than the first quarter. See, the end of the game wasn't based on the end of the first quarter. The end of the game was what's the score after the fourth quarter. And the older I get in my life, I begin to understand that many of our notions of growth, many of our notions of becoming are so far off base. Because by most people's understanding, I will be 38 this year. I'm turning 38 in just a couple of months. But by most people's understanding of becoming, I have become who I am going to be at 38. But the gospel tells us a different story. See, some of you, you believe you are who you are simply because of a number attached to your age. And I tell you that I am still becoming who God wants me to become because I'm still breathing. And so if you are in your 30s, you are becoming who God wants you to be. If you are in your 40s, you've got more becoming to do. 
if you are in your 50s, if you are in your 60s, if you are in your 70s, you have not yet stopped learning and becoming the person that God wants you to become. My prayer is that in five years, I will have become more like Jesus in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. If by God's grace, he gives me that long, I will still be changing. I will still be growing. I will still be becoming who God wants me to be because my legacy is going to be determined by how I finish. It's not screwed up by how I started. You can fumble on the first play and still become greatness with one second to go. I mean, how many times did you see that happen in games over the years? I mean, this is a guy that blew it for four straight quarters. I mean, they were cutting him. The coach had whispered in somebody else's ear, hey, get that kid into the minors. He's not good enough. And then with one second to go, he changed the whole landscape, and now he's on every highlight reel. Your fourth quarter matters, friend. Do not believe that because of your age, you do not continuously need change and growth and discipleship because the next generation is going to be determined by you continually becoming more like Jesus Christ in your life and the people around you will determine that. See, our relationships impact our growth. It is not by accident that the context of verse 6 is in the same section as gospel partnership. See, the Apostle Paul is talking about the importance of understanding what God is working in our lives is impacted by those around us. You see, missional partnership requires a united belief about the future. I was once talking about international missions with an old mentor of mine from the North American Mission Board, and we were talking about a partnership that he was pushing me towards. And he was talking about what they believed about the end. He was talking about what they believed about what Jesus was going to do in the future. And I, and I was just like, is that really the most important thing? And he looks at me in the way a mentor sometimes looks at a moron. <laughs> and he said, Steve, how can you partner together if you're not going the same direction? <laughs> how can you partner together if you don't have the same goals? How can you partner together if you don't have the same hope about where we're headed? It was a life-changing conversation for me because I began to realize the impact that our understanding about the future has on us. You need to look at the relationships that you have built and the relationships that you are building and ask, are we headed in the same direction? Because the people around you determine a lot about your future. The efforts of those around us tell us a lot about ourselves. See, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 17, Solomon puts it this way. He says, whoever heeds instruction is on the path of life, but whoever rejects reproof or correction leads others astray. You see, this is a statement about goals. This is a statement about direction. Where are you going? Do you even know? You see, friend, you cannot hope to find your people if you don't know where you are going. Are you on the path of life? Are the people around you on the path of life? Are the people around you headed in a direction that will lead to your mutual upbuilding and your growth and your success and your becoming the person that God wants you to be in Jesus Christ? Because you see, there are people that will keep you from the life that God wants you to live. There are people that will prevent you from going the direction that God is calling you to go. Make no mistake, you will end up wherever those people are going. See, because you believe a lie that because of one shared affinity, one shared commonality, that these are the friends that you need in your life, that these are the influences that you need in your life. Not if you're not heading in the same direction. So you can't head opposite directions and be in perpetual fellowship with one another. Either one of two things will happen. Either you will get so far from each other that those relationships are over, or you're not headed in such an opposite direction after all. You're headed in the exact same direction, but believing a lie about the direction that you're going. See, because if you're not influencing people, you're being influenced by people. See, friend, what you need to understand 
is that sometimes you may need to have some hard conversations with the people around you. Maybe you need to have some final conversations. Maybe you need to have some corrective conversations. But don't believe the lie that you aren't going the same direction as those close to you. Do you want to go where they're going? Do you even want to be where those people are? Because you see, friends, what God starts, he finishes. But where you are going shows whether God has started and or whether you are hampering the process of what God wants to do in your life. Number three this morning, you need to initiate influence. You need to initiate influence. Look at what he says in verse 7. Verse 7 is something that we usually pass over, but it's amazing. Here's what he says. <clears throat> it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. I would love to think that Paul would say such words about my life. I would love to think every one of those because here's the path that Paul has been on for these verses. He says, I thank God every time I remember you. I mean, these memories that we shared with one another, they are so amazing of the work of God. It is so amazing what the Lord has done that I'm praying for you that God will continue to do that work. And when I pray for you, I'm given over to this amazing joy in my life because of what we shared together and understand that God's going to continue to do more of that work in your life because what God starts in someone's life, God determines that he will finish that work in someone's life. And at that point, you might be saying, Paul, I do not deserve for you to say such things. I don't believe that the apostle Paul, we're talking earthquakes at midnight, Paul. I don't believe that I deserve such language. And Paul says, oh, friend, it is right for me to feel this way about you. It's because I hold you in my heart. And then note what he says. He says, because you have been there with me. Because you have been there for me. He says, you are my partner. You have partaken of the same grace of Jesus that I have partaken of. You've been with me in my imprisonment. You've been right beside me in my defense of the gospel. You've been right beside me when the Lord has confirmed the gospel with me. He says, you are my partner in this. What an amazing thing. So that makes me think, what do I need to do so that Paul can say these things about me and so that they're true? And then I begin to think about influence. You see, friend, you need to initiate being influenced, and you need to initiate influence. You see, in verse 7, this is true because Paul has initiated influence. Paul has initiated discipleship. And Paul is saying the church at Philippi has initiated these same types of lifestyles, these same types of threads. See, because sometimes we treat these people like they're nothing like us. And I can understand that to a degree when we're talking about Paul. I mean, he is an apostle after all. But Paul is saying the same journey that I'm on, God is doing that in the lives of everyday people in Philippi. They're my partners. They're not less than me. They're more than me in some cases, but I know they're with me in all cases. They're initiating this. They're not waiting for someone else to do it. They're not waiting for someone else to deliver it. They're not waiting for a sign. They're not waiting for a moment. They're not waiting until this season is over. They're not waiting until they have more time. They're not waiting until they have more margin. They're in it right now. I love Amazon Prime. It's the greatest gift of my life. Because if it's in the Chesterfield branch, I can order the waffle maker at 6, and it's here by 3. And that's amazing. But if it's not, sometimes it takes that third day, and I almost die. <laughs> so 
because I needed those waffles yesterday. <laughs> but sometimes that's how we treat discipleship. That's how we treat the work of God. We're waiting for it to be delivered in this nice little neat box on my doorstep, and I'm just going to open the door one day, and I'll be like, it's here. Sanctification has set in in my life. The Lord has just made it happen. I woke up following Jesus. I don't know how, but I'm on it now. I'm in it. It doesn't happen that way. You have to initiate it. And so long as you look at it like that, you will never have it. It will never be something that you can own. See, the Apostle Paul is encouraging. He's clarifying that these parameters are what a life that is worth living is built on. See, in Proverbs chapter 27, it says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. It's an amazing analogy about the way growth and wisdom and sharpness in life is perceived and understood that we are to help one another to grow. We are to help one another become the people that God wants us to be. But the opposite of that is also true, I've found, is that you can dull one another. Is that just because you have people doesn't mean that iron is sharpening iron. See, it can mean that you're both just sitting in quicksand, hoping that the other one will get you out of it while the other one is actually sinking you deeper in it. See, some of you, and this is going to be probably controversial to some of you, but it's probably the most loving advice you've ever received. Some of you need to walk away from most of the relationships in your life. Some of you need to get rid of a lot of the influence that is in your life because they are not sharpening you. They are dulling you down. They are negative. They're full of complaint. They are full of apathy. They are full of other people need to do, other people need to be, other people need to start, other people, other people, other people. And they are dragging you so far down that you cannot get out of it. And you say, well, what can I do to help them? Right now, nothing. Except walk away. See, because you cannot help them until you help yourself. You cannot help them until you become what God wants you to be. You cannot help those influences in your life until you walk away, get influence in your life that will help your life. You become more obedient to Jesus, and then through you becoming, they will see what real life looks like. They will see what a life worth living is all about, and then the Father will work. But when you see someone in quicksand in the movies, I don't even know if quicksand really exists. But if you're watching the movies, the answer to quicksand isn't, well, let me just jump right in there with you and nuzzle down. No, you got to walk away and get a rope or just walk away. <laughs> Those are your options. But for the sake of the gospel, go find a rope. <laughs> And only then, when you are equipped, can you hope to help. See, so many of you think that you can help when you're in the same condition. You can't. Friends, do not let negativity rule your life. Do not let what someone else should be doing rule your life. Do not let apathy rule your life. And then look and say, oh, I don't know what the problem is. I found my people. No, you just found people that made you feel better about the situation that you're in. It didn't help you one bit. You need to find people that will help you, and you need to initiate the right type of influence. You see, the people in Philippi, they shared Paul's mission. They wanted to reach the world. They wanted to build a life that matters, and they were going after it with Paul. That's why they were his partners. How do you get this type of partnership in your life? You initiate it. No one can do it for you. It's not going to show up on your doorstep one morning. You know, I get some feedback sometimes that we need to program these types of things into the life of the church. For years, I, I mean, honestly, for years, 
I've struggled with that. But I have talked to probably dozens of other pastors, and they catch the same feedback. Even when they try to do something about it, they continue to catch the same feedback. And then one day, a more seasoned pastor explained to me, he said, you need to understand that, that with the structure that you have, if people say things like, I can't find any friends, or I can't find the right types of friends, he says, that isn't a valid statement. He said, the church isn't the problem, they are. He says, especially in this type of environment. You see, every environment that we have is literally organized and built for you to find your people. For you to engage in discipleship. I mean, people are everywhere. Join them. No one can program this for you. I mean, I look around this room. I look at just so many people, and I can see some of you, and you are the people that someone else needs to find. Some of you are the people that I have found. You've been so abundantly helpful in my life. You've been so sharpening in my life. And when you say, I can't find any, I can't make any friends, I can't find any people. Here's the deal. I can't make you friendlier. I can't. I can't find you influenced. You are being influenced. But it's your choice who and what you're being influenced by. See, there's passive influence and there is active influence. See, just because you aren't pursuing influence doesn't mean you're not getting it. You're getting it but it's probably the wrong type. Life doesn't just happen. You pick the environment that you are in. You need to stop acting like you are floating from random environment to random environment with no control over it. It is not up to someone else. It is solely up to you. You have to initiate what you want in this life. It amazes me that God has made us as creatures who make choices. And I will never understand how that all works out in this age. It's only in the kingdom that I think I'll truly understand how that works. And we have preferences. Sometimes, many times, your choices reveal that your preferences aren't what you say they are. Because I will hear you say, I am desperate for discipleship. I am desperate for relationships. I am desperate for community. Okay, here's 10 options. None of them fit me. Leads me to begin to think we aren't the problem. You are the problem. You see, if you want discipleship, you will get it. If you don't want discipleship, guess what? You will not get it. And if you've been here for an extended period of time and you're not getting it, it's not because we don't want it for you. It's because you don't really want it. You won't change. Paul initiated. And he says that the church at Philippi was initiating. You see, Paul understood that the cross and the resurrection of Jesus reveal that God has something for us that is greater than what we have for ourselves. But you have to step out of yourself and enter into the life that Jesus has for you to get it. So if you won't submit to the process at hand, then you need to stop blaming others for your lack of involvement and influence. You need to step into the path of life that God has for you. He wants to continue the work, but you have to walk into it. It's not just going to happen. It's not, it's, it's not that enough people aren't like you. It's that you won't change who you are. See, and what you need to understand is that whoever told you that God doesn't want you to change who you are to become, become more like who Jesus is, That person did not read the Bible. Wherever you learned that who you are is all that matters, that you don't need to change to become something else, that is a person that did not give you good advice. They lied to you. So, well, my personality, well, my preferences change. Change your personality, change your preferences, 
change your emotions. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and initiate or you will never get it. You've got to go after it. God wants us to have the right people in our life. But to do that, we need to enter into the life that God knows what he wants to give. You see, God knows what he's talking about, and until you realize that, you can't have the life he wants for you. He's made so many promises in Jesus that he plans to keep. Whether or not you will get to experience that is determined on whether or not you follow him into that. I've seen it. It's real. I've experienced it. It is joyful. Find your people. Find the right people. Activate the faith that will grow you into the person that God has designed for you to be. And then continue to become that person. As the band comes forward, I was reading a report the other day found through a study that we are more individualistic now as a society than we've ever been before in a history of the world, yet we say we want community more than we've ever said it in the history of the world. And so what's the disconnect? Well, the disconnect is that some of us say we want something, but we mean something completely different. See, you were not created to live a life where I'm just an individual on my journey. You were created to become the people of God. And that means to empty yourself, to give in to the lives of others, to receive from the lives of others, to find your people and grow together toward the life that God has for every one of us. It's difficult. It can be very messy. It can be disappointing. It can be discouraging. But under the power of God, it will be the one filled with the most joy, the one filled with the most growth, the one filled with selflessness rather than selfishness. I pray that I continue to grow and the people that I surround myself will determine that growth. See, every week our response is what God told us our response was to be. Eating of the bread is representative of the body of Christ that was broken for us. Drinking of the cup is representative of the blood that Jesus shed for us. And when we eat and when we drink, we are stating that we believe that Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and that he rose on the third day to give us a new life. To reconcile our relationship with God and then through that reconciliation begin a process of reconciliating our, reconciling our relationships with others for the rest of our lives. Do you believe that? Because it's the gospel. Do you want that? Because it's the best life you can have. It's the only one that leads to God. Friend, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, no matter what's going on in your life, these tables are open for you because God has removed all the barriers. So when you can, to the front, to the back, come, eat, drink. But then when you walk into your life, understand that you need to find your people. And if you found your people, you need to stay committed to those people and grow and grow and grow when you're ready.